Well, this is going to be a, a test for me. I still have, man, I, I walk a little bit and my legs cramp up and I get so tired. But I have to go to Tennessee and I have to try to catch this plane at four. So uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. <laughs> um, look, there's so much to glean from Purim in a, in, a, in a way. You know, there's so much application to it. You, you know the story. I think what we miss in the story, you know, everybody knows that scripture. Perhaps you were born for such a time as this. And they repeat it over and over and over again. And uh, they see God's hand in the deliverance of his people. But I think what we miss is they had no business being there. <laughs> I, I, th I think maybe you didn't miss it, but a lot of people miss that in the story that they were being disobedient only because they don't know history. You know, 537 Zerubbabel, who was in the Davidic line, and he was the grandson of King Jehochen, he returned back after this exile in 537. Remember, they got exiled 607, and the Bible said, you'd be in exile for 70 years. So 537, this guy who's the governor of Israel says, okay, come on, let's go. And everybody goes, no. And 95% of the Jews, maybe demographers tell us there was about a million Jews, then they stayed. And why did they stay? I mean, I, I hate to say this because I'm one of them. The same reason why Jews stay in the United States today. Who wants to go to Israel? And then it was raised to the ground. They burnt it. It was just nothing. Why would they go there when they were living large in Persia? And they were respected for the most part. Nobody bugged them. While they were in Persia, and Persia was dominant, and it was beautiful. You know, Persia, Iran, they, believe it or not, at one time it was absolutely stunning. So they were disobedient, and God came to the rescue. The question is, did God come to the rescue because he loved his people? Or did God come to the rescue because he had to keep his promise? Both. But he had a plan of salvation. Now, if all the Jews were exterminated and there's no Jews now, there would be no Jesus now. I don't say that arrogantly. It's just the truth. And God promised through his first covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, he said, I'm going to save the world through this Jewish lineage. So I've got to preserve them. Otherwise, I can't save the world. My question for me and other Jews who are now in the United States is, if we're in the last days, and the nations surround Israel, and I'm here in Macon, will he come to my rescue? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. So we celebrate this because we're told to celebrate this. There's always going to be <laughs> these discussions. Do Christians have to celebrate it? First of all, I don't like that word, have to. It doesn't, I'm sorry, but it doesn't sit well. Do I have to be obedient? Do I have to love you? Do I have, have to, that doesn't sound right to me. You know? What if I want to? Don't, don't get caught up in, in, in all this DNA crap. And, oh, I know my, my last name is Spanish, and I know the, the Figaro is with Jewish. You don't know that. You want to celebrate Purim because it's part of your history as a Christian? Then do it. Don't make a federal case over it. And don't try to get everybody else to celebrate it. I think sometimes when we're not sure of our own faith, we try to get as many people to agree with us so we could feel confident and secure. If God told you to do it, you need more security than that. If God tells me something, I don't need people to pray for me about it. He told me, and then it's just a matter of whether I want to do it or not. The, the problem that some people have with the book, and I, I know this, I'm just going to throw this out there because some of you might have it. It doesn't line up exactly with some historical books. But when did we as believers let history dictate whether the Bible was right or not? I mean, the Bible's inspired. History is not. And who writes history except the winners? 
and they write it according to how they want to write it. I mean, no, listen, this is ticklish. I have the guy from the report, he goes, do you ever talk about any hard issues? I just started laughing at him. But I don't know Lincoln. I didn't live with him. I never talked to him. I would think that he was a pretty good guy. He's considered top three presidents that ever, you know, was in the presidency of the United States. But part of the reason he fought abolition and fought for abolition was he was in the midst of a war and he wanted to win that war and he wanted these black cats working for him and fighting in the Union Army. So that was a motivation. And they don't always tell you that in school. But like I said, you can't really totally trust history. Not all the time. But there are a lot of historical documents that corroborate what the Bible says. But stick with the Bible. Why are you going outside the Bible? You're going to change the canon? Who died and left you, boss? Just, just throwing that in there. God's name is not mentioned in the book. And Christians have had a problem with that. You don't got to mention God's name to know he's here. You got, I, remember, I remember when I first kind of got saved, I, I was watching a couple of things on TV way back, a couple of pastors, and they said, don't you feel like God just came in the room and touched you on your shoulder? Let me tell you something, pal. If God comes in the room, I don't need you to tell me. If you got to tell me, he didn't come in the room. See what I'm saying? Just because God doesn't sign his name at the bottom of every page of history doesn't mean that it's him. I mean, there was a point in time, to be honest with you, in the hospital, I just had a crisis of faith. You know? I, I, told, I told my guys recently, I called them my guys, my teaching team that I developed. I told them two things. I said, one, you cannot preach to people what you're not doing yourself. You cannot do that. God hates that. Because he doesn't want us to practice what we preach. He wants us to preach what we practice. I said, but if there is a subject you want to preach on, and personally you're struggling with it, why don't you just tell them? What's wrong with that? You know, for years, the church wanted that guy up there to be perfect. Now, some people in the church went the other way and lost respect for the guy that God called to lead. You know what I'm saying? Don't smack me in the back of the head and call me Greg because I'm going to smack you in the back of the head. I'm going to give you respect as a believer, as a person, as a child of God. Just, I'm just looking for the same. I'm not looking for no applause. But there are people that are called to be gatekeepers. There are people that are called to be evangelists. It's an office that God calls them. And if nothing else, respect the office. Respect God's call about the office. So it went, it went from one extreme to another. It went either the guy up there was like a, a, a god, a demagogue, and now he's just Dave. Both extreme positions. Extreme isn't always so great, you know? I told the Lord, look, I'm not asking you to heal me. I'm not asking you to deliver me. I'm asking you to show up. It was like day 46. I'm just asking you to show up. Just whisper my name, Greg, and then leave. Just come in this dark, dismal, depressing situation and just tap me on the shoulder. Let me know you're here. One of the devil's greatest weapons is to make us believe in divine betrayal, to make us believe that we've been betrayed by Almighty God. And I was just, and all of a sudden, you want to talk about like a penitent heart. You want to talk about t changing in a second when God spoke to me and said, Greg, every CT scan, every procedure, every surgery, every single time they wheeled you somewhere, I was right next to you. God's right next to you, man. Right next to you. So there are some practical lessons from the story of Esther. There's just three I want to share. There's tons. 
I'm sure that you can come up to me afterwards and go, Rabbi, I was thinking about, yeah. But there's no need for me to belabor the point, but there's three that have always jumped out at me, okay? Uh, the first point is everything God says is important. Everything. Even if we don't understand it. Why do you have to wait till you understand something to obey what you heard from God? Why? I don't know if my kids understood why at four years old they were throwing out garbage and washing the car and clearing the table. I don't know if they really understood it, but they were doing it. They were being conditioned. It's too late when they're 13 and they just have the game controller in their hand on the couch. You think, no, I can get them to do it then. You got to set those patterns up early. Nobody gets a free ride, kid. Mm -mm. Not in the Hirschberg household. They, they were so happy to move, remember? <laughs> Jeremy moved and he handed the bucket to Shane and she started washing the car. She moved and then Max started washing the car and Lily just moved. I don't know how. <laughs> She's like, yeah. I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to go to school out of state. I just don't want to wash the cars. That was her deal. Uh, let, let me give you an example from the book of Esther why everything God says is so incredibly important. Esther 2.5, it says there was in Shushan. That's the capital. It was by the water. It was a pretty spot. You know, they're going to pick a really pretty spot for the capital of the empire. A man who was a Jew whose name was Mordecai. And why do you think the, 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 the Lord puts all these this, this lineage in there, you know, where, where he's descended from, there has to be some reason why. He could have just said there was a Jew's name was Mordecai. Done, period. End of story. And so we look at this and we go, who cares? I think if God put it in there, you should care. There's some reason. So he was from the tribe of Benjamin, and he was an ancestor of Kish, a Benjaminite. Now, what do we know about Kish? This is 483. Go back 600 years, okay? And let's go to 1 Samuel 9, 1 through 2. There was a man from Benjamin, same tribe, named Kish. There he is in 1 Samuel, 600 years earlier. And we go through all his lineage. He was a man of substance and brave as well. He had a, a son named Shaul, Saul the first king of Israel. So this Kish character is really important. He was young, good looking. Among the people of Israel, there was no one better looking than he. He stood head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. So Kish had a son named Saul who became the king of Israel. Going back to Esther 3.1 for a second, it says, sometime later, King Ashaviros began to single out Haman the son of Hamdada, the Agagai, for advancement. Eventually, he gave him presence over all his fellow officers. So he had the signet ring. He had the honor, the power. What he said goes. Haman's ancestor is King Agag. Now, Agag is a royal title. It's not a real name. It's like Pharaoh. That wasn't a name. It's a title, more of a title. So Agag was the royal title to who? The Amalekites. Agag goes back to the Amalekites. Now we go back to 1 Samuel for a minute. I know this is a lot, but so, so far we know that this, this Mordecai comes from the lineage of Saul. Now let's see where this Haman comes from, the lineage. And we'll go to 1 Samuel 15. It says, Shmuel, Samuel, said to Saul, the king, Adonai sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now listen to what Adonai has to say. Uh, are, you, are you listening, Saul? Okay, you are? Good. Here is what Adonai Tzivaot, the Lord of hosts, that means the powerful God, says. I remember what Amalek, they show up. I remember what Amalek did to Israel. This is God talking. I remember what they did. How they fought against Israel when they were coming up from Egypt, and you could read about it in Exodus, now go and attack Amalek. Completely destroy everything they have. Sounds harsh. Maybe God knows what he's doing. 
Don't spare them, but kill men and women, children and babies. This is the God people don't want to know. Nobody's teaching about this God. Cows and sheep and camels and donkeys. Then Saul attacked Amalek like he was ordered by the prophet, starting at Havilah and continuing towards Shur, the whole province at the border of Egypt. Let's continue. He took Agag, the king of Amalek, alive. Well, what happened here? He, he, he did everything except for, and why did he take the king? It's a trophy. Bring him back to Israel, parade him around. They literally would almost put him on a leash and parade him around and take their booty and say, look, you know, I'm the victor. Bragging rights. But he completely destroyed the people, putting them to the sword. However, Saul and the people spared Agag, along with the best of the sheep and the cattle, even the second best, also the lambs and everything that was good. They weren't inclined to destroy those things. I'm not going to throw. It's like, hey, you know, I'm a believer now, and I have this album collection, and I'm not going to just throw it out. At least I should sell it and let somebody else listen to this terrible junk. Hey, I don't do the drugs, man. I just sell them. Not a bad guy, right? But everything that was worthless a week, they completely destroyed. So Saul almost listened. King Agag obviously took a wife and had children, and they had children, and they had children, and one of their children's children's children, 600 years later, was Haman. If he just would have obeyed, there would have been no Haman. There would have been no need for God's intervention. Everything would have worked smoothly. But Saul, sadly enough, had a problem, like a lot of us. 99% obedience is disobedience. What did, the, what did the Lord say about, about the Amicalites in Deuteronomy? Look, Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19. Remember what Amalek did to you on the road as you were coming out of Egypt. How he met you by the road. Attacked those in the rear. Who was in the rear? The women, the old people, the disabled. They were bullies. Those who were exhausted and straggling behind when you were tired and weary. He did not fear God. Amalek is a descendant of Esau. Therefore, when Adonai your God has given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land Adonai your God is giving you, Israel, King Saul, you ought to blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. Don't forget. This is really important. Even if you don't understand it. But obviously they did. And then Agag's descendant, Haman, in the spirit of the Antichrist. I just want you to know, there's been many who have come over the centuries. And this might be freakish to you, but if you're a Christian and you don't love the Jewish people, you've been doused with the spirit of the Antichrist. I'm not saying you are, and I'm not saying you're following him, but that is the spirit of the Antichrist. That's why everybody hates the Jews. It's a spirit. Anti-Semitism is a spirit. Why do people, they're, they're, they're a non-issue. 99.8% of the world's population is not Jewish. They're a little nothing people in a little nothing land with no resources. They've got to do sick measures just to irrigate their crops. Who cares about them? But yet there's people that hate the Jews. They grow up hating the Jews. They don't even know why. Why do you hate the Jews? I, I don't know. My parents did. Well, they'll say the Jews have all the money. You're an idiot. The CEOs of companies, all of them are not Jewish. They're blue bloods. 
Okay, they're in finance and they're doctors and they're lawyers. You know why? They did something stupid like go to school. Because education was really important to the Jewish people when they came here. But this is a big deal, man. Again, no Jews, no Jesus, and this would hinder, hinder God's plan of salvation. Here's the bottom line for rule one. When God says something, just carry it out. He said, I don't want you to spare a donkey. I don't want a jackass's hoof back in Israel. What's the big deal? When God says something, it's a big deal. It just is. I mean, he's God. Look, figure it out, okay? You love the world, get rid of God, and go for it. The world's a lot of fun. I've spent 30 years in the world. I had a ball. Rabbi, did you really have a ball? Yes. No, you weren't really having fun. I was too. So then go with the world. Go for it. Have a great time. But if you're going with God, then go with him hard. Amen. Choose this day who you're going to serve. Amen. Number two, this won't take long. God is in control of all. I know you've heard this a million times. I know you've heard people say this. But looking at the story of Purim, it's a no-brainer. Look at Esther 3, 2. All the king's servants at the king's gate would kneel and bow before Haman because the king had so ordered, but Mordecai would neither kneel or bow down. At this time, this is the way they paid homage to Eastern monarchs. You bowed, prostrated yourself before them. That's what you did. It was, it was part and parcel of the culture. You had to. You couldn't go into a, a, a king's room, even if you were invited, even if he held out the scepter. If you were to turn your back, you got your head lopped off. It was a sign of disregard. Respect is hard to come by today. Most young people don't respect nothing. Authority, it's, such, it's so rebellious. There's such a spirit of rebellion. It's hard to fathom. Mordecai wouldn't kneel. Obviously, it infuriated. You've got to realize everybody's kneeling and this one guy's standing. I mean, you want to talk about standing out like a sore thumb. If you're a real deal believer, you're going to stand out like a sore thumb. People are not going to like you. They're going to come against you. They're, who knows? Who cares? Young people, stop worrying. Old people, stop worrying about what everybody thinks about you. It's going to drive you crazy. If everybody likes you, you're good. If everybody doesn't like you, you're bad. Somebody comes up to me afterward, right? Let's just say and go, I just want you to know I'm here for the first time and I, I really enjoyed your sermon. I plan on coming back. Hawk the herald angels sing. <laughs> what if you like what I said, but I didn't deliver what God wanted me to? What if I delivered what God wanted me to and you hated it? <laughs> You didn't, you didn't sign my, my certificate of salvation. He would not bow. Why? Because he was a devout Jew. It was just that simple. Exodus 20, 1 through 5. You know what it says, man. It's the first two. Then God said these words, I am the Lord your God. And I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And I delivered you out of the abode of slavery. You ought to have no other gods before me. You are not to make for yourself a carved image of any kind of representation of anything in heaven, above, on the earth, beneath, or in the water below the shoreline. You are not to bow down to them or serve them, for I, I don't know your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third, even the fourth generation of those who hate me. This is the first commandment that was given to the children of Israel. And then if we fast forward, uh, this is probably about 1,300. So fast forward about 1,300 years. We have a similar situation. Look at Matthew 4. 
Once more the adversary took him, Yeshua, up to a summit of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, how magnificent the world is. And he said, all this I will give to you. Could he? He's the God of this world. He could have handed him the authority then. All you got to do is bow down, Mordecai. Mordecai was like an intercessor for the people. He was kind of like a savior in a way. Away with you, Satan, Yeshua told them. For the Tanakh, that's the Old Testament, it's an acronym. The Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, the writings, the prophets, and the first five books. Worship out of your God and serve him only. He wasn't going to mess up on the timing. He knew that God was going to give him all authority was going to be given to him in God's time. And he wasn't going to jump on ahead of the, of the Lord. Esther 3, 3 through 6, the king's servants at the king's gate, you saw the play, asked Mordecai, why, why don't you, I, this is crazy. They're going to kill you. Like, just bow down, even if you don't mean it in your heart. Who cares? Just bow down. It's easy. But after they confronted him a number of times, he just didn't even pay him no mind. He's like, you don't get it. Just like Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar is like, I love you. You're, you're the chief of my seers. Like, I love you so much, Daniel. Come on. Just stop facing Jerusalem when you pray. It's an easy out. And Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar, this is not to hurt you. I've got to face Jerusalem to honor my Lord. You asked me to do something I can't do. But I'm the king. I've got to show my authority. If you keep facing Jerusalem, I'm going to have to throw you in the lion's den. Did he know he was going to be delivered? No. How do you know? A lot of people get thrown in the lion's den and don't get delivered. God decided to turn this lion's den into a petting zoo. But he might not do that for you. Are you still willing to go in the lion's den? However, he learns that he's part of the Jews, so this psychopath in the spirit of the Antichrist says, look, I'm not going to just kill Mordecai. That's not enough for me. I'm going to kill all his people. I'm going to annihilate the Jewish people. Proverbs 16.33 says it like this. One can cast lots. Pure. Poor. That's how they decided. Throw the dice. But guess what? God's going to determine how they land. You, you think you're in control? Yeah, you can make some good decisions, but you're in control of very, very little. Lamentation 3.37 who can say anything and have it happen without Adonai's commanding it? I'd like to quote one of the greatest theologians of all time. Man's plans, garbage cans. <laughs> Last but not least, third lesson, God turns the tables. This is, it's almost crazy. It's almost crazy what God pulls off. But we got to keep reminding ourselves, he's God. Doesn't mean he's going to, you know, do it according to the script that we write. But he's God. Take a look at Esther 7, 9 through, 9 through 10. It says, Harvona, one of the king's attendants, said, Look, the gallows, 75 feet high, that Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke only good for the king, is standing at Haman's house. The king said, hang him on it. Man, you want to talk about a reversal? This guy makes the gallows to hang Mordecai thinking he's going to get the king's blessing, and he ends up being hung on it. You don't have to worry about Satan digging pits. Satan's going to fall in that pit forever. So they hanged Haman on the gallows. Esther 8, 1 through 2. The same day King Ashavirus gave the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Esther the queen. Peasant girl. Little peasant girl. Also Mordecai appeared before the king, for Esther had revealed his relationship to her. The king removed his signet ring. The signet ring is huge. Ancient kings in the east used it to designate authority, ownership, and honor. You, if you had the king's signet ring, forget it. Everybody bows down. The king removes his signet ring, his personal signet ring, which he had taken back from Haman, and said, here, Mordecai, put it on. Crazy stuff, man. 
Then Esther put Mordecai in charge of Haman's house. <coughs> Nuts. Esther 9, 1 through 3. The time approached for the king's order and decree to be carried out. He could not take back his word. He put forth an edict. Haman convinced him to put forth an edict. You say, well, couldn't the king just say, okay, okay, I rescind the edict. No. No, when the king says something, it has to be carried out. He can't speak with a forked tongue. The day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to overpower them, 127 provinces. But as it turned out, the opposite took place. The opposite. Not, not just that the anger subsided. The very opposite, the antithesis. The Jews overpowered those who hated them. Thus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, which happens this evening, the Jews assembled in their cities throughout all the provinces to attack anyone who tried to do them harm. No one was able to withstand them not because the Jews were powerful, not because they had an army. They, they were so unmatched and outgunned. It was pathetic. But somehow, God put the fear of himself on them, and they were so afraid they were stymied. They couldn't even fight. You know, when you have fear and you try to throw a punch, it's going to be like this. All the officials of the provinces, the army commanders, the governors, and those occupied with the king's affairs helped the Jews. So not only could the enemy couldn't fight, but they, they sided with them. This is crazy. Guys, this is crazy. You could see a Purim play. You could read the book of Esther. You tell me you believe it, but you have trouble believing for so much less. How could that be? It's illogical. How do you believe this and not think God's going to bring you through the end days? You really think a bunker is the answer? You guys can't live together in a beautiful house. You think you live in a bunker for seven years? <laughs> All the officials of the provinces, the army commanders, the governors, and those occupied with the king's faith helped the Jews because they were afraid of Mordecai. Crazy. Last but not least, Esther 8, 15 through 17. Meanwhile, Mordecai left the king's presence arrayed in royal blue and white. His royal robes. He was in sackcloth and ashes, crying, pounding his chest, fasting, pleading with God. Now he's wearing the royal robes. He's got a crown on his head, fine linen, purple. And, and the city of Shushan shouted for him. For the Jews, all was light, gladness, joy, and honor. In every province and city where the king's order and decree arrived, the Jews had gladness and joy. A feast. A feast and a holiday. Many from the peoples of the land became Jews. <laughs> Boy, you want to talk about turning the tables. <laughs> so God's people once again go from potential extermination to crazy joyful celebration. All because God is faithful to his promises. Amen. The Abrahamic covenant must be fulfilled and God's plan of redemption must be fulfilled. This is not the first anti-Semite and it won't be the last. Anti-Semitism is a well-worn path that always buries its traveler. Just ask Pharaoh, Haman, Antiochus, Hitler, Arafat, Hussein, and Ahmadinejad. So we started with three premises. We took a look at three practical lessons. I'll close with three points. Make every Baptist happy with me today. <laughs> Esther 4.14. Four it says, for if you fail to speak up now, this is Mordecai, speaking to his cousin Esther, who he pretty much raised. Relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from a different direction. God will deliver us. God will deliver us, Esther. But you and your father's family, you'll perish. Who knows whether you didn't come into your royal position precisely for such a time as this. Guys, every believer has a role to play. I don't know if that's prayer. I don't know if that's feeding the homeless. I don't know what it is. You've got to figure that out. But 
everybody has a role to play. You might say, Rabbi, I'm, I'm homeschooling four kids. I, I, don't have, I don't have time to shower sometimes. Okay, then raise those kids to be sanctified. That's a role. Don't belittle that role. As far as God's concerned, that is a very important role you're playing. The world, they won't be impressed. Who gives a crap? Why are you trying to impress the world? You never will. Prayer and fasting can be used as a lever, but some of you got to put some legs on your prayers, man. I say, speak up. Speak up. Don't let the enemy or the world system shut you down. Who are they to back you in a corner? Get out of the stands and onto the field, and for God's sakes, play your part. This is not a spectator sport. It's a participation sport. Perhaps you and you and you were born for such a time as this. Number two, Esther 10.3, the last chapter, very short chapter. For Mordecai the Jew was second only to King Ashaviros. He was a great man among the Jews, popular with all his many countrymen. He sought the good of his people and interceded for the welfare of all his descendants. I believe every, everybody, everybody that's in the body of Messiah should be a Mordecai. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if every believer strived according to his or her ability for the prosperity of the kingdom? Amen. Mordecai in English means little man. Little man. Aren't we all just little men and little women working for a great, big, ginormous, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent God? Amen. Guys, You've gone on enough retreats. It's time to go on an advance. Stop retreating. Believers don't retreat. We press. We press forward. And we fight. And we fight the good fight. And we don't punch at the air. And we don't lay down. And we don't give up. No matter what's going on. We are the light of the world. Don't hoard the light. And don't hide the light. Play your part. Play your part. Last but not least, Esther 6 1. That night the king couldn't sleep, so he ordered the records of the Daily Journal brought, and they were read to the king. This verse declares that King Ashaviris couldn't sleep. It doesn't say that the king doesn't sleep, he couldn't sleep. Thankfully, we serve a king who doesn't suffer from insomnia but never ever gets drowsy. He's always on guard, he's always watching, he's always in control. And this is the very message of Psalm 121. Look at the four verses. If I raise my eyes to the hills, some people had a problem with this, some Christians, because they didn't understand. They were like, this is blasphemy. You know, you always get nuts. You know, I found out that deodorant companies, uh, they have a pro-life. Uh, you know what? Don't use any product and, and stink to the high heavens. Because if you look into every company, you're going to find something that doesn't make you a spawn of Satan. Don't be too weird because then your little kids are going to be weird. And then they're going to go off to college and freak out and get involved in some crazy crap. And you're going to be, how did that happen? Because you were just too dang weird. What they're saying is looking to the hills, that's where the temple was, and the Holy of Holies was the residence of God. They were looking at God, not the hill. Where does my help come from? Oh, great hill. Oh, deliver me, hill. Yeah, but people had a problem with this. What I'm saying is, you're nuts. Some of you worry about minutia, but then you don't get sanctified in big areas. Oh, I can't eat the pepperoni. But what are you watching? Or better yet, no, I can't watch that eat the pepperoni, but I'm not going to share the gospel. Heck no. I'm going to take care of my own. 
oh man, I saw this guy today, man. He was like so, so poor. There's, there's this couple that sits outside on North Side, and finally I had to talk to them because every day the sign says the same thing. We're short $18. I said, if I give you $100, we get rid of the sign and get out of here. <laughs> You've been short $18 for about a year and a half. Like nobody's buying it. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Adonai, the maker of heaven and earth. He made heaven and earth. Where are you going to run to when you're in trouble? He made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. Your guardian, that's your bodyguard. You know how these rich stars have a bodyguard? You ever see those bodyguards? You don't even go near, you're like, no. Nope. You know what I'm saying, right? God is your bodyguard. He's not asleep. No. No, the guardian of Israel never gets tired. If I had to title this song because it's some, I would call it kept. Alexander the Great told his soldiers, one of the greatest warriors of all time, quote, I wake that you may sleep. He only slept like an hour here and there. And he told them, I wake, I stay awake so you guys can get rest. Throughout the night hours when we are no longer conscious of the world around us, there is one a lot greater than Alexander who is watching over us with constant, unwearied care. In these last days of ours, the nations of the world will become the enemies of God. It's in the process. Our deliverer won't be Moses, and it won't be Mordecai, and it won't be the Maccabees. In these last days of ours, our deliverer will be none other than Yeshua, the Messiah himself. <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong. I, I, I've been a Jew for a long time. I love celebrating the Passover feast. Love it. And I do love celebrating the Purim feast. And I really, really enjoy celebrating the Hanukkah feast. But my heart's desire as a believer in Yeshua is to celebrate the wedding feast. In these last days of ours, yes, the nations of the world will surround Israel to once again attempt to wipe her off the mount. The Lord will touch down on the Mount of Olives. The mount shall split. He'll walk through the Kidron Valley. When he touches those gravestones, people are going to pop out of the ground. He's going to bust through the eastern gate, and he's going to clean house like never before. Amen. All I could say is, come, Lord Yeshua, come. Let's stand together. Guys, I, I just want to encourage you to keep fighting. And, and as far as sharing, I know there's a fear. I'm going to probably teach on it maybe in two weeks. I know there's a fear. I know there's a feeling of rejection. But I'm here to tell you, the more you do it, the easier it gets. It just does. Like anything else, the more you do it. And you know what? You'll feel so good when you do it. You'll feel so, like, even if it doesn't work out the way you kind of want it to, you just feel so purposed. You feel like you're right in the center of God's will. You know what I mean? There's nothing better than sharing the gospel. I got a letter this week. A guy like, wrote to me. He's been watching. I, I want to know how to get saved. I never pray with somebody and have them repeat what I say. What if they don't agree with me? They're just going to repeat it anyway. So I gave him a little outline of things that are important. And he wrote back to me this week. And he said, I did it. I feel saved. I feel filled with the Holy Spirit. I found the Messianic congregation. None's better than that. We feed, we clothe, we do all that crap. You know why? To get them saved. You know, you could be fat and warm and go to hell. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Chadonoi, Vaishmarecha, 
Ja, er hat eine neue Punkt auf Vehunecha, Yesa Adonoi, Pono Velecha, Veasem Lecha, Shalom. Spot Shalom, guys.